Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to look at finite precision arithmetic. We're going to look at how modern computer hardware represents real numbers and processes arithmetical operations, and we're going to look at the typical rounding errors that we get with these systems. This knowledge is really important for when we come to design numerical algorithms using these systems. So from here on in the course, a number of code examples will be provided. And these are all available in the AM205 Git repository that you can find linked to off the main course website. So Git is an example of version control software, which is extremely useful when developing any kind of software project. So the basic way that Git works is that it connects snapshots of your project as it develops. And it provides you an interface that allows you to roll back any files to any previous version or compare files to any previous version. It also allows you to sync those snapshots with other people um, via repositories stored on central servers. So Git is an extremely useful tool and it's great for debugging because it can allow you to look at exactly what you changed in your project. And if you're not familiar with it, then I would definitely encourage you to learn more about it. So in the slides, we use a little notation um, such as code underscore example.py that is a link to the corresponding code in the Git repository. So Git is the software itself, but there are many websites available that host Git repositories online. And one of the most popular of these is GitHub, which is where the AM205 examples repository is stored. And if you go to the GitHub website, then you can actually browse individual files in the AM205 examples repository without even downloading them. However, if you want to download them, then you need to make sure that you have the Git client available, which is a command line program that's available for most major software platforms. And once you have this, you can type the command git clone git at github.com colon chr1shr slash am205 underscore examples dot git and that will make a copy of the entire repository onto your computer. If at any point updates are applied to the repository on GitHub, then you can use the command git pull to sync your repository to the one on the server. If you prefer, there are also graphical interfaces available for GitHub that provide an alternative for interfacing with the repository. OK, so let's just take a quick look at the AM205 GitHub repository. So if we go to the main course website, then there's a link to the repository on the front page. So if you click on this link, then we see a number of things. There's a readme file that gives us some basic information about the repository. And then we also see this window that allows us to browse the individual files that are in the repository. And so if we click on the unit one directory, then that will take us into this directory and we can see all of the individual code examples. So we can now click on an example like spline.py and this would show us this, this code. And it also has nice syntax highlighting as well and shows us things like line numbers as well. So the GitHub website is very useful for browsing the files, but we might actually just want to get a copy of these files onto our local computer. And if we go back now to the front of this repository, then there's this green button here that actually allows us to download a copy. So the Git program can transfer files over several different protocols. One of the ways it can do it is using HTTPS, which is the same way that websites are transmitted securely. And there's also this option to use SSH, the secure shell. And I'm going to demonstrate using SSH here. So it gives us the address to access this repository. And so I'm just going to copy this text. And now in this command line window over here, I'm just now going to type the command git clone and the address of the repository. And that will now make a copy of the repository onto my local computer. And if I now look in this directory, I find that I have the directory called AM205 examples. And if I change into this, then I'll see all of the same files that I can see on the GitHub website. So one thing to note here is that this repository actually does contain additional information. So here it just looks like a number of directories. But if we do ls-a, 
that will actually list hidden files in the, this directory. And we'll actually see that there's a hidden folder here that's called .git. And that actually stores all of the database information about, about the repository itself and all the history of changes of the repository. So from here, we can then go into any of these directories and run programs and do other things. If there are any changes that are made to the repository online, we can use the command git pull, and that will sync our local copy to what's on the website. And so if I do this here, then it will just tell me that there's no updates just because I just checked it out. But if any updates are pushed to the repository, then this would bring them into our local copy. So let's talk about finite precision arithmetic. So there's a key point here that when we represent numbers on a computer, we only have limited storage available. Each number has to be represented using a finite amount of computer memory. And on modern computer hardware, the typical approach that's done to represent real numbers is to use an analog of scientific notation. So in general, scientific notation provides us with a very flexible way to represent numbers across many scales. We could think about large numbers like 5 times 10 to the 20, or small numbers like 1.23 times 10 to the minus 86. And in both cases, we have a very compact representation. So the same benefits can be used on computer hardware. But here, we do everything in a binary number system, base 2. And if we want to represent a number like x, then the way we can do it is we can say that this is equal to plus or minus 1 plus d1 times 2 to the minus 1 plus d2 times 2 to the minus 2, and so on, plus dp times 2 to the minus p, multiplied by some power of 2, 2 to the e. And equivalently, we could actually write that out as a binary expansion. So that number would look like plus minus 1 dot d1, d2, dot dot, dot dp times 2 to the e. All of the numbers d are binary numbers, so they're either 0 or 1. And we can always ensure that the first number in the expansion is equal to 1 by adjusting the value of e. The one exception to this is the number 0, but that's represented in a different way that we'll get to later. So in our computer hardware, we'll therefore store a number using three different components. We'll use one binary digit, or bit, to represent the sign of the number, either plus or minus. We'll use p bits to represent the mantissa, the kind of binary expansion of the number in, in the scientific notation. And we'll use a number of bits to represent the exponent uh, that we apply to this number. So it's worth noting that the term bit is a contraction of binary digit. And an interesting fact is that this notation actually comes from Claude Shannon and his seminal paper, The Mathematical Theory of Communication, that really laid the foundations for much of the field of information theory that really works a lot with the ideas of binary information. So, as mentioned, this format assumes that the first uh, digit in the, in the binary expansion is 1, due to our choice of exponent. And depending on how many bits we use to represent the exponent, it will lie within some range for, from L to U. So there's a universal standard that's used on modern hardware for representing finite precision numbers. And that's referred to as the IEEE 754 standard that's been around since 1985. And the development of the standard was led by Professor William Kahan at UC Berkeley. And he actually received the Turing Award in 1989, a famous award in computer science for his work. So there's two standards that we'll see throughout this course. There's the IEEE single precision standard that uses 32 bits, or 4 bytes. And that uses 23 bits for the mantissa and an exponent range from minus 126 to 127. The IEEE double precision standard uses 64 total bits, or 8 bytes in total, and uses a larger range for the exponent. So with the single precision standard, 8 bits are used to represent the exponent, and that would give you a total of 2 to the 8, or 256 possible exponent numbers. But the actual range here, from minus 126 to 127 only covers 254 of those numbers. And we can use the additional two numbers 
to represent special numbers in our number system. So as mentioned, zero does not fit within the scientific notation, and so we can use one of those special exponent values to represent it. So these standards are really important. They're used in billions of computers worldwide, in many mission-critical operations such as the airline industry, the financial industry, or the healthcare industry. And we really want to ensure that our numbers work as expected. And the developers of this number system, Professor Kahan and his team, are really cognizant of this fact. And there's a really interesting piece of computational history where they developed a code called Paranoia.c that could actually test many features of the numerical system. And we'll take a look at that in a second. OK, so we'll just take a quick look at the Paranoia.c example code. And so I have a copy of it here. And on the right here, I have it open in MacVim, a graphical interface to the Vim text editor. And so if we go through this, then we see that it does a number of different tests of the, of the arithmetic system. And we'll now try compiling it and then running it. And so it's written in C, so we'll use the GNU C compiler to compile it. So we'll just have GCC dash O paranoia paranoia dot C. And now we'll try and run this program. So, so we'll go through now a number of arithmetical tests of our number system. And there's a few points here where it prompts us to do various things. And so it looks at all the different arithmetic operations that we can perform. It does things like check things about square roots and, um, and so on. And there's actually a point here where it asks us to compute one divided by zero. And this is a useful test because it allows us to see what result we get here. And it's likely here that we're going to get the value of infinity, which is represented within the IEEE standard. So we'll say yes here. And they will also compute here 0 divided by 0. And this will also now give us NAN, not a number. And so here then, the, the code has finished. And here we find that our arithmetic system on, on this computer appears to be excellent. And no problems have been detected. And typically for most modern computers, this is, this is true. But historically, there have been various problems, and this code was very useful for diagnosing them. So in the Paranoia.c example, we saw several cases where our number system could represent special values. We saw that it could represent inf for infinity, and that will result when we do 1 divided by 0. There's also minus inf if we do something like minus 1 divided by 0. And we also saw nan, standing for not a number which results when we do an undefined operation like 0 divided by 0. So it's worth noting that Siri actually has some opinions about 0 by 0. And I'm just going to ask her for her what she thinks. What's 0 divided by 0? Imagine that you have 0 cookies, and you split them evenly among 0 friends. How many cookies does each person get? See, it doesn't make sense. And Cookie Monster is sad that there are no cookies. And you are sad that you have no friends. Thank you, Siri. Sure thing. So now let's talk about the IEEE floating point arithmetic standard from a more mathematical standpoint. So let f here denote the set of floating point numbers that we can represent in our number system. So f will be contained within the real numbers but f will be itself a finite set. So there's a question here of how we would represent a real number x that lies outside of f. So there's two cases for us to consider. The first case here is that x could be outside the range of f. So it could either be too small or it could be too large. And in the second case, the mantissa of x might require more bits than we can use. So let's look at case 1 where x is outside the range of f. 
it could be too small. And let's look specifically at the IEEE double precision standard, where the smallest exponent we can represent is about 10 to the minus 323. So if we use a value that's smaller than this, then typically we get what results as underflow, and the value is just rounded to zero. The second case that could happen would be that x could be too large. And in the double precision standard, the maximum exponent that we can represent is around 10 to the 308. And if we have a value that's larger than this, then we get overflow. And that value is, is typically rounded to infinity. So let's look at case two, where the mantissa of x requires more than p bits. So that could be the case for a number like pi or e, where we have an infinite expansion. So what we'll need to do is we'll need to round x to a nearby number. And let's introduce an operation, round, that takes us from the reals into the floating point numbers. And there were several different options we could use for this. For example, we could round the number up, we could round it down, or we could round it to the nearest value. And when we do this, we're going to introduce a rounding error. So that will be the absolute rounding error will be x minus round of x. And we'll also have a relative rounding error of x minus round of x divided by x. So it's really important to be able to quantify this rounding error. And this is related to the important concept of machine precision that we write as epsilon, or sometimes epsilon subscript Mac. And epsilon is defined to be the difference between 1 and the next floating point number after 1. So specifically, epsilon will therefore be equal to 2 to the minus p, where p is the number of mantissa bits. And now triply double precision, epsilon works out to be about 2.22 times 10 to the minus 16. So suppose we look at the rounding error that we might get. So let's look at a number outside of our floating point system, and we'll represent this as x, which is equal to 1, followed by p binary digits in, in the mantissa, and then an additional 1, uh, dp plus 1. So what we can say is that x will be in a small range from x minus to x plus, where x minus is the number where we would remove that dp plus 1, and x plus will be that number plus our machine epsilon multiplied by the exponent um, 2 to the e. And now when we apply our rounding operation to x, we will either get x minus or x plus, depending on which rounding rule that we use. And we can go further, and we can actually therefore look at the size of rounding error that we've introduced, round x minus x, and the magnitude of this will be less than epsilon times 2 to the, to the exponent. And here, we, we can we can actually say that this is less than because this interval is of, is of size epsilon times 2 to the, to the exponent. And because we would not round from one end to the complete other end, then we will never have this case of actual equality in this bound. We could actually do a little better if, for example, we looked at the round to nearest rule. In that case, we might actually be able to get a factor of 0.5 in here as well. However, this formula here, this bound where we say things are less than epsilon times 2 to the exponent, is general for all rounding rules, and so we'll keep using this from now on. Another thing we can note here is that the magnitude of x is actually greater than or equal to 2 to the exponent. So hence, if we look at the relative error, we get a very nice formula. We actually find that it will be less than the machine precision epsilon round of x minus x divided by x will be less in magnitude than the machine precision epsilon. And another standard way to write this is that if we look at round of x, then we can actually write that that would be equal to x multiplied by 1 plus delta, where delta has magnitude less than epsilon. And so in other words, we can say that rounding will give the correct answer, but within a factor of 1 plus delta. So now that we've talked about rounding, let's talk about floating point operations that our computer can do. And we'll write these in terms of the usual arithmetical symbols, 
but surrounded by a small circle. And computer performance is often measured in terms of flops, which is the number of floating point operations that a computer can do per second. And in particular, this is often used to measure the performance of different supercomputers. And they're often run on a specific benchmark problem, referred to as the Linpack test, which performs a dense linear algebra problem. Currently, the fastest computers in the world are in the 100 petaflop range, where one petaflop is, is actually equal to 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second. And there's a very interesting website called top500.org where you can look for up-to-date lists of the fastest supercomputers in the world. Currently, the fastest supercomputer in the world is in Japan, and the number two and three spots are computers that are in the United States. And it's very interesting looking at this table at the actual power requirements that are needed for these computers, which are often in the range of 10 to 20 megawatts. These supercomputers often have large rooms of many computers that are connected together with fast interconnects. And there's some really interesting engineering and hardware challenges about doing this, to do with power supply and with cooling and so on. So the IEEE standard guarantees that if we have two numbers x and y in our floating point system, then if we do a floating point operation on them, then the result will be equal to the rounding operation applied to the mathematical arithmetic performed on x and y. So from our discussion of rounding error, we can therefore conclude that for any floating point operation will at most be a factor of 1 plus delta away from the true result, where delta is bounded by epsilon. So machine precision can be tested. And I'm now going to show you an example where we can actually see the size of machine precision on our computer. Usually, the rounding errors that we get from machine precision are benign, and we don't need to worry about them. But there are certainly practical cases that arise where those rounding errors can be important. And we'll take a look, look at an example of this too. Okay, so now we'll take a look at how to measure machine precision on a computer. And I've got a small code example up here called actest.py. And what this code does is it first defines number h equal 1, and then it performs a loop where it progressively multiplies h by a factor of a tenth. And so h then becomes much smaller uh, very quickly. And at every point here, it will test whether the arithmetic operation of 1 plus h is equal to 1 or not. And if it is, it will say so, and if it's not, it will, it will also say so. So let's just run this program and see what we get. And we see here then that as the program's running, this value h is decreasing by a factor of 10 on each iteration of this loop. So we go from 1 to 0.1 to 0.01 to 0.001 and so on. And to begin with, all of these arithmetic operations like 1 plus h are not equal to 1 as we would expect. But we see that once h equals 10 to the minus 16, then our arithmetic system reports that 1 plus h is actually equal to 1. And this is exactly what we would expect. We know that machine precision is around 2 times 10 to the minus 16. And so once we hit this value of 1 times 10 to the minus 16, then that's too small to be adequately resolved with our number system, and so therefore we just see equality in this test. So I also have a version of this code that is written in C++, and it is structured in exactly the same way here, and I just also want to now run this program as well. And one reason I want to do this is because I just want to emphasize here that what we're really observing here is actually features of the computer hardware and it's independent of the particular programming language that is used. So the code structure is exactly the same and I'm just going to compile this here using the GNU C++ compiler G++. And if I run that, 
then I see that I get exactly the same behavior as before. I see here that as h is decreased by a factor of 10, I hit this point where it, once it reaches 10 to minus 16, then it reports that 1 plus h is equal to 1. So in C++, I'm able to explicitly say that the numbers that I'm dealing with here, h, are double precision floating point numbers. So this is the IEEE double precision floating point standard using eight bytes to represent each number. But in C++, I can actually, I can actually modify this uh, to use just single precision floating point numbers instead. So let me just change here this double value here to just say float and I'll recompile this program and try again. And so here now, the program is going to work in single precision floating point. And we see now that the equality is reached much sooner. And for single precision floating point, our value of machine precision is much larger, roughly around the square root of 10 to minus 16. So we see here then that once h reaches 10 to minus 8, we have equality again. And so typically then, when we're doing with Python, most, most uh, programs by default will just be running using double precision. And, and often for most scientific applications, using double precision is the, is the standard approach and often what we want to use. Single precision is often more useful for cases where performance is critical, such as, for example, any real-time graphics. So often these rounding errors that we see are rather benign. Even for single precision floating point numbers, these are only happening around 10 to the minus 8. And for dual precision, this is around 10 to the minus 16, often much smaller than what we're actually interested in. But it's definitely worth being aware of the issues here, because there are cases where it can be important. And I just want to illustrate a case here by running Python in the interactive mode. And suppose now that I looked at doing a calculation like 1 plus 10 to the minus 20 uh, minus 1. And so if I run this calculation, then it reports a value of 0. And this makes sense. What happens is that Python first adds the 10 to the minus 20 to 1. And because 10 to the minus 20 is too small, that 10 to the minus 20 will just get rounded away and we'll just get 1. And then when we subtract 1, then we'll end up with 0. And that may not be what we want here. We could see here that actually just rearranging the, the steps here would give us a different result. So suppose we do 1 minus 1 plus uh, 10 to the minus 20, then because the 1 minus 1 is evaluated first, then that 10 to the minus 20 is retained. And so you often find that this case can come up in practice. There are certainly cases here where you might be looking at the balance between two terms. And if you don't deal with the order of operations correctly, then it can have a significant effect on the result that you might measure. So if you're interested in learning more about IEEE floating point arithmetic, I recommend the book Numerical Computing with IEEE Floating Point Arithmetic by Michael Overton. So we've now looked at the rounding error associated with one floating point operation. But in this course, we're going to look at algorithms where we chain many floating point operations together. And when we talk about a stable algorithm, we want that those floating point rounding errors won't build up over time and give us a garbage output. And an important way to quantify this is in terms of backward stability. So the idea is that if we're solving a problem, our numerical method should give us the exact solution to a slightly perturbed problem. For example, suppose we were trying to solve the matrix problem AX equal B, then our numerical algorithm could give us the exact result to a slightly perturbed problem, A plus delta ray multiplied by X, is equal to b plus delta b. So it's worth noting here the importance of conditioning. So while backward stability is useful, 
it doesn't help us if the actual underlying mathematical problem is ill-conditioned itself. For example, suppose that A is an ill-conditioned matrix. Then, even if we have a backward stable algorithm, we can still have a case where the result of AX equal B can have a large error on X itself. So backward stability analysis is kind of a deep subject, and we'll only really touch on this in Applied Math 205. However, we will compare algorithms with different stability properties, and we'll look at the importance of stability in practice.